Hey there kiddos! Thanks for tuning in to watch my video. Today we're going to cover ecological systems in the first chunk of the last unit for the year, ecology. Ecology is the study of the interactions among organisms and between organisms and their environment, called a habitat. A habitat is just where an organism lives and includes both biotic and abiotic factors. Biotic factors are living organisms and they can include any organism from the archaea, bacteria, fungi, protista, plantae, or animalia kingdoms. Remember, a means not, so abiotic means not alive. Abiotic factors include sunlight, pH, temperature, precipitation, salinity, and soil and air. Here is a picture of a habitat with a bunch of enlarged biotic factors. Don't forget that the plants are biotic factors too. Easily identifiable abiotic factors in this picture include the air, water, soil, and rocks. While you should know this from the cellular energy unit, the sun is the main energy source for life on Earth. Autotrophs, also called Producers are organisms that capture energy from sunlight or chemicals and produce their own food. Remember, photosynthesis is the process of using solar energy to produce food and occurs in plants and chemosynthesis is the process of using inorganic compounds or chemicals to produce food and occurs in organisms like the archaea near hydrothermal vents. Heterotrophs, also called consumers, are organisms that get their energy from consuming other organisms. Herbivores, like cows and deer, only eat plants. Carnivores, like lions and wolves, eat other animals. Omnivores, like humans and bears, eat both plants and animals. Less familiar heterotrophs, but no less important, include the detritivores and decomposers. Detritivores, also known as scavengers, like snails and crabs, feed, feed on plant and animal remains and other dead matter. Decomposers, like bacteria and fungi, break down organic matter. Without detritivores and decomposers, the entire biosphere, or Earth, would be littered with dead organisms. They are nature's garbage men. A food chain is the most simple ecological model. It shows the one-way flow of energy in an ecosystem. The most important part of a food chain is the is that the arrow always points in the direction the arrow or sorry the energy is going. They always start from the sun or inorganic chemicals, then go to the autotrophs, then to the heterotrophs. Each step of the food chain is called a trophic level. On the food chain here, you can see this bottom level includes the additional, or sorry, the addition of the sun. Always be sure to include the source of the energy. Autotrophs are also called producers. The herbivores are referred to as primary consumers as they are the first to consume another organism. The first organism, whether carnivore or omnivore, to eat the primary consumer is called a secondary consumer. The organism that eats the secondary consumer is called a tertiary consumer since it is the third consumer. The organism that eats the tertiary consumer is called the quaternary consumer since it is the fourth consumer. Only 10% of energy flows from one level to the next. As energy flows from one level to the next in the direction of the arrow, a large part, 90%, is lost through heat and work done by organisms. Let's take this food chain here. The sun is the primary energy source. The grass is the autotroph or producer. The cow is an herbivore, so it is a primary consumer. Samuel L. Jackson is an omnivore, and in this food chain, he is a secondary consumer. The grass gets 100% of the energy from the sun. The grass loses 90% to work, like growing and reproducing. 
so only 10% of the original energy is actually consumed by the cow. The cow loses 9% of the original energy to work and heat. So only 1% of the original energy is actually consumed by Samuel L. Jackson. I've had students ask, if plants have so much energy, why do humans stop eating meat and go directly to plant-based diets? Do you remember what the cell walls in plants are made of? That's right, cellulose. Our bodies cannot readily digest cellulose like herbivores can, so a lot of the energy passes right along through the body. A bunch of food chains clustered together make up a food web. In this diagram, for example, six different organisms eat krill and the leopard seal eats four different organisms showing several interconnected food chains. A food pyramid allows for the visual representation of decreasing amounts of energy, living matter called biomass, or the number of organisms at successive, successive trophic levels. Successive just means following one another. Before we dive into the levels of organization larger than one individual, let's review those levels smaller than an individual. Atoms, which is the smallest unit of matter, makes up compounds like water and lipids. A bunch of uh, compounds make up organelles, like nucleus or mitochondria. <laughs> A bunch of organelles combine to create cells. A bunch of cells together can make tissue like muscle and a bunch of tissue make up an organ such as heart, eyes, and lungs. A group of organ organs make up an organ system, like the digestive system. A bunch of organ systems make up an organism, like Ryan Reynolds. But wait, what comes after this? Let's take this individual here, an elk, as our organism. When this elk is around its family, a gang of elk, yes, a group of elk is called a gang, make up a population. This population shares its space with other organisms like a herd of moose, a pride of cougars, a drove of hares, a parliament of owls, a colony of beavers, and a grove of pine trees. These organisms make up a community. The community is part of a larger ecosystem, which includes a sleuth of bears, a convocation of eagles, the river, lake, soils, mountain, and air. All the ecosystems with this type of environment in similar communities are collectively called a biome. All the biomes are included on the same ball of life called the biosphere, and until life is definitively identified on other planets, it only includes Earth. Let's go over this a little slower and change the organism. Let's take a colorful powder blue tang. A school of tangs would be a population. These creatures will compete amongst themselves for food, mates, and resources. Not water in this specific example because um, they're fish and they live in the water. Remember that a species is a group of organisms that have similar characteristics that are able to breed and produce fertile offsprings. Yes, we covered it this year um, earlier, I promise. A group of interacting populations of fish living in the same place at the same time is called a community. If one species disappears, other species will be affected. We'll dive into this later, get it? dive, fish. A bunch of communities that interact with their environment is called an ecosystem, like a coral reef. An ecosystem includes biotic, which means living, and abiotic, which means non-living, factors. This is the first level that includes abiotic factors. Ecosystems can be found on land, called terrestrial, or in water, called aquatic. There are two main aquatic ecosystems, freshwater, like ponds, lakes, and streams, and saltwater, called marine, like oceans and seas. 
living, non-living. A bunch of ecosystems with the same climate and similar communities is called a biome. Climate, for those paying attention, is just the average temperature and precipitation over many years. An example of a biome is the tropical rainforest where there are a wild variety of wildlife called biodiversity called it can be found. Here's a diagram of the different biomes. You can see in the north in purple where it's really cold there's a biome referred to as arctic and alpine tundra. Around the equator where it's really warm there are biomes like the tropical rainforest in red, tropical savanna in yellow, and desert in pink. Wait a second, there are two splotches of purple, which means it's really cold near the equator. Why do you think that is? What can be found in areas in these areas of the world? Why tall mountains, of course, the Andes in South America on the left, and the Himalayas in Asia on the right. Okay, now let's see what we can, we can actually remember. There will be a multiple choice question after each color is said. Give yourself time to think and then see if you are right. Purple is tundra. Red is tropical rainforest. Maroon is chaparral. Not entirely sure how to say that, um, but you can see that that is mostly in California and then you have in the Mediterranean Sea and a little bit in South Africa as well as in Australia. Pink is desert. Yellow is tropical savanna. Gold is temperate grassland. Lime green is boreal forest. Green is temperate deciduous forest. Now take a second and find Virginia on this map. Which biome is Virginia in? That's right, the temperate deciduous forest. Temperate means it doesn't get too hot or too cold and deciduous is the type of trees that lose their leaves in the winter. Lastly, you have the biosphere. The highest level of organization that supports the life is called the biosphere. Again, life um, isn't definitively identified on other planets, so until then, it only includes Earth. All right, let's talk about symbiosis. Symbiosis is the close relationship between two different species. There are five types, mutualism, commensalism, parasitism, predation, and competition. Mutualism is the relationship where both organisms benefit from one another. One example for this is the coevolution of coral and algae, where the algae makes glucose through photosynthesis and the coral absorbs the glucose. The coral benefits from the food that algae um, makes and the algae benefits from the coral's protection. This type of symbiosis can be identified as a plus plus since they both benefit. Commensalism is a relationship where one organism benefits and the other doesn't benefit or get harmed, so it doesn't care. An example of this is the shark and remora. The remora clings to the bottom of the shark by a suction cup on top of its head. It can easily detach from the protection of the shark to eat the scraps. This type of symbiosis can be identified as a plus zero, since one benefits and the other is neither harmed nor helped. Parasitism is a relationship where one organism benefits and the other is harmed. A parasite lives in or on an organism of another species and a host is harmed. An example of this relationship is the tomato hornworm caterpillar and the brachinoid wasp. The wasp lays eggs on the caterpillar and when the eggs hatch, the larvae eat the caterpillar. This kind of symbiosis can be identified as a plus minus since one benefits and the other is harmed. Predation is a relationship where one organism, called a predator, hunts and eats another organism called prey. 
An example of this relationship is that between lions and zebras. This kind of symbiosis can be identified as a plus minus since one benefits and the other is harmed. Competition is an interaction between organisms for resources such as food, water, space, or mates. This can include individuals of the same species or different species that use the same resources. One example is the relationship between lions and cheetahs. Another is humans competing for the last toilet paper roll. This kind of symbiosis can be identified as minus minus since both organisms expend energy in order to compete. All right, so let's see what we remember. There will be a multiple choice question after each scenario. Give yourself time to think and then see if you were right. Clownfish live among the venomous tentacles of a sea anemone. The clownfish are protected by its predators and they keep the sea anemone protected from its own predators. That's right, mutualism, a plus plus symbiosis. Tapeworms live in the intestines of cats where they absorb nutrients from the food the cat eats. I know it's pretty obvious, it's parasitism, a plus minus symbiosis. Lastly, barnacles attach themselves to the shells of crabs. The barnacle receives a home and transportation. The crab is not harmed. Commensalism, a plus zero symbiosis. If you've been dreading these distance learning and assignments, don't dread this one from me. I promise it's not that bad. Go to Google Classroom and answer three questions on a Google form by April 24th. Do not include any examples from this presentation. The first one is you're going to identify one organism you might find in your backyard, local park, neighborhood. Go out and see what you can do. Um, you have a, you're going to list the components of its levels of organization up to the biosphere. For example, if I look out my, my side door, I will see a deer. Okay, I don't see one now, but I saw one earlier today. Um, let's say the organism is a deer. Its population would be a herd of deer. Its community includes the herd of deer, the coyotes that run through the neighborhood, uh, squirrels, grass, and some Bradford pear trees that stink like high heaven right now, um, but they're really pretty. So um, the ecosystem includes the community that I just listed, plus the rocks, the stream that goes by, and the air, and it goes so on and so forth. For the community and ecosystem parts, be sure to include at least four biotic factors. For the ecosystem part, include at least three um, abiotic factors. This will be listed on that Google form. The second thing is you need to identify which biome Virginia is in. If you don't remember, watch this video again because I promise you we talked about it. And last one, identify an example of each of the five symbiotic relationships discussed that you might find in your backyard, local park, neighborhood. Go out and see what you can do. Uh, get some fresh air, look at the world around you and get inspired. Be sure to stay at least six feet away from other people. I miss you guys. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any questions. Take care and make good choices.